Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. We had to think of where our space is. And given that I come particularly from bank payments, EFT or ACH in the United States, and have an understanding of credit card, we thought that it would be best to combine both open banking aspects with payments to kind of create a seamless product that you can pull off the shelf and sort of eliminate the hassles of having to understand all the nuances that are going to come down the pipeline in both Canada and the United States in the coming years. That was Zoom Rails co-founder and CEO, Mark Maluski, and he is my special guest on this episode, episode 212 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to make you aware of some things going on here at the Leaders in Payments podcast. We're launching a new series of podcasts called The Pulse of Payments, where we're focusing on a specific topic for an entire month. For example, we'll be covering embedded finance, open banking, cross-border payments, and more. Also, you can sponsor episodes or even amplify existing content like white papers or research reports. There are several options to reach out to our audience. And if you've ever thought about starting your own podcast, please reach out. We're B2B podcasting experts and can help you launch and market your very own podcast. For more information on these opportunities, please contact me directly at greg at leadersandpayments.com. And now back to the show. Mark has a passion for building, a love for farming, and a history of solving problems in the music industry that really fueled the foundation of his professional payments career. Mark wanted nothing more than to build hydrogen cars in Iceland, but found himself building payments technology in Canada. Zoom Rails is a fintech company with a mission to change payments as a whole into something they call financial interactions. According to Mark, the best way to think about them is open banking meets instant payments. As for their competitive advantage, Mark himself said it best. Our competitors think about payments as just payments. We see it as something completely different. Tune in to hear Mark and I talk about his journey to the role of CEO, where he sees the industry going in the next two to three years, and much, much more. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Mark. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thanks for having me, Greg. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. If you don't mind, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. We'll talk about your professional journey in a minute, but maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I was born and raised in Southern Ontario. Dad, who was an entrepreneur, so he had his own business. I went to school in a rural town. Graduated in the double cohort when you were 17, so I went to university at 17, not really knowing what you're going to do. I have an honors in economics and a minor in natural science. In university, I kind of stumbled upon running music shows as a source of income. I, uh, I was heavily into the punk and metal scene, and uh, at that was the time around mp3.com, and I wasn't really good at playing bass, and I was an okay singer, so... I want to be involved, so I started booking shows. And so throughout university, I ran music shows and got in honors in economics and a minor in natural science, hoping to go to Iceland. Big problem. Graduated in 2008 when there were no jobs in Iceland, developing hydrogen technology. So what do you do? Uh, You go work for a bank, and I guess that's where the beginning of the payments journey starts. Okay. All right. We'll pick up right where you left off in just a minute. But let's talk about the company Zoom Rails. So tell our audience what Zoom Rails does. Well, it's Zoom Rails and the accent above the U it makes the um sound because I think Zoom was actually taken by another company in Phoenix. Oh, but um God. <laughs> so, yeah. My but, apologies. Uh, so, no, no worries. It's you're not the first we've had to explain that to. You know, Zoom Rails, we are Open banking meets instant payments. It's the way I've always explained it is that we all know in payments that there's all this new stuff coming with money moving instantly between bank accounts. We know that open banking has been talked about at nauseum as well. It's our belief that if you're going to move money instantly, you have to adjudicate for risk. And sort of as we dissect the many layers of Zoom Rails, at the core of the being is that we think that payments as a whole 
are going to change into something called financial interactions. So how you would finance, how you collect banking information or how you collect client information should seamlessly transition into a payment, a storing, tokenizing, adjudicating risk, and then actioning it. As we all know, the payments industry as a whole is quite crowded and there's declining revenue. I think in 2010, the average profitability on a publicly traded payments company was 49 basis points. 2015, it goes down to 29 basis points. And meanwhile, Stripe is making around 100 basis points and growing like crazy. We had to think of where our space is. And given that I come particularly from bank payments, like EFT or ACH in the United States, and you know, have an understanding of credit card, we thought that it would be best to combine both open banking aspects with payments to kind of create a seamless product that you can pull off the shelf and sort of eliminate the hassles of having to understand all the nuances that are going to come down the pipeline in both Canada and the United States in the coming years. That would sort of be a very high level. If you could get really deep into it, how we have distribution, how there's maximization between the different rails, like Visa Direct and MasterCard Send, how we can do liability shifting. But <laughs> we only have an hour, and this isn't a sales pitch. But yeah, it's a different way of thinking about payments and whole and sort of trying to forecast them into financial interactions. Okay. So what countries are you operating in today? Well, you know, we are Canadian. We're self-funded, and we have about 42 employees. And uh, we are just at the final stages, are getting all of our acquiring and FOB accounts set up in the United States. So we're hoping, and the goal of the company is by Q2 to be fully operational in the United States, including Canada. We're already in Canada, but in the United States, we'll be up and running then. Then after that, it's sort of a, where are we going to go next? <laughs> Whether we, we have a path forward in Europe, we have a path forward in the UK, and obviously Australia as well. But that all ties into another piece of our platform called the Partner Portal. One of the things that makes Zoom Rails really unique I've always thought there's two really interesting parts about payments that kind of get overlooked. One of them, obviously, is the software, the value add that you provide as a company right away. So when someone looks at your company, you're like, hey, what problem do you solve with your software? Or how do you make my life easier? Because if it's just a commodity, then like, you know, listen, we're not interested in fighting over nickels between different companies. Like it's, it's how much time, what is the speed of service, how much risk, all those other variables that quite get overlooked and pricing comparisons. So we think we have something really special there. But our other aspect is distribution. And we always say, you can create the greatest television show on earth, but it doesn't matter if it's not on Netflix or cable television. If it's just a YouTube original, it doesn't matter. So we built into our platform a partner portal that allows software as a service and ISOs to negotiate custom economics with us, whether it's split or buy rates. Then they can onboard and sell directly to their clients downstream. So, you know, as we talk about the financial interaction, it's also the interaction of onboarding clients. It has to be seamless if we're really going to try and compete with the big companies out there. So our distribution model allows us to partner with lots of software who has payments as sort of a peripheral or a value add to their offering. Because of doing that, since we have a lot of partners in Canada, well, we have distribution in the States because most of those partners have a 10x market down south. And then as we trickle down, well, they have a UK presence, an Australian presence, and sort of our decision making is going to be based on opportunity size based on those partners and where we think we can go next. Okay. What, what would you say is the main pain point that you're solving for? Immediately it is sort of based on, if we were to look at like our clients right now, there is a subset of clients who understand that moving funds quickly, especially from bank accounts, and sort of being able to sleep easy at night and onboarding, like all in this seamless swoop, they understand that as a huge value add to their business. Quick example, uh, we all remember what happened with GameStop. You know, everyone wanted to get in on on the rocket ship uh, as they thought it would never stop. But, you know, if you had to move funds through a bill payment network, you'd take three days and you'd miss out. If you had to pay with ACH, you'd have to essentially, if it was next day, you know, you wouldn't be able to action instantly. There's an element of sort of, I don't want to say bravery, but there's an element of challenger banks and fintechs who look at pieces of a bank's business, the legacy bank's business, and say, I can do it better. I can make this experience better so that I can own a piece of that pie. And so we work a lot with companies like that because you know we work with the Canadian version of Robinhood here so that instead of clients waiting three days to buy a stock, they can get onboarded 
and move money instantly from a bank account and have a complete liability shift, which is something that doesn't exist between EFT and ACH rails, and they can buy stock. So in the movement of essentially billion dollars, you have no chargebacks and no fraud. Because we also built a bunch of other cool stuff on top of it, like name matching. So essentially saying, hey, we have a better way of doing it. And you kind of have to, I don't want to say take a risk, but you have to believe us and you have to see it. There's an element of just like a shared, I want to say commodity of going after something that is kind of held by legacy systems. So yeah, we have clients who are saying, hey, we can do something better than that exists today, but this is part of the puzzle. And, and, And Zoom is no different. Open banking and instant payments have been talked about since 2016 here in Canada. But the reality is that in 2018, or no, 2017, essentially figure out how to do this, but also do it better than both the governments and the banks from a small office in Prince Edward Island. And that was what basically was able to convince most of the C-level staff, most of everyone to join our company because, yeah, it's like we figured out a way to make it work, to make it work better than everyone that's promised it since day one. That sort of who we are and why it's important to other companies because they see it. The market now demands that money moves instantly and the market demands that there has to be a quicker way and you don't want to wait forever. So that's what we do. Okay. Is there a, and I assume, and excuse my ignorance, is there similar sort of instant payment rails in Canada to the US? Like, you know, FedNow is coming out soon and, you know, I assume there are similar rails in, in Canada. Yeah, if we want to get into like to the nuance of this stuff, we can. The problem with the movement of funds instantly, whether it be from EFT, which is Canadian, or ACH in the United States, even with Fed now, is that there's still sort of an asterisk beside everything. It's in regards to PAD regulation. So for those not familiar, PADs are pre-authorized debt agreements. In Canada, we have the first version coming out, which is only going to be instant payouts, which really is there's ways that we can do that right now with up to 25k a transaction. So it really only serves a small subset of the market demanding it. But on the flip side, if you want to pull funds, there's still a 14-day chargeback window in which someone can challenge the validity of the funds moving instantly. So for example, Greg, if I debit your bank account for 100 bucks, I'm going to get it instantly when these rails magically materialize. We, there's no plan, by the way, in Canada for that part. <laughs> that I can validate. And when that happens, I'm like, great, I have your money. But you have a 14-day window in which there's about, not only can you say, hey, I didn't agree to this, who is this company, all these sort of things, but there's even sort of gray areas where like, if you had 95 bucks, you're going to front me the 100, but then you have 24 hours to cover it, and then the funds get clawed back. So long story short is that even though you're, I'm getting the money, I have an exposure of 14 days that I can move it or if I'm in the middle of the transaction as in a marketplace, you can basically be left holding the bag if something comes back. Because there's no way to shift the liability, which is really what needs to be discussed. Is like There needs to be something with regards to that. So we do that actually now through the Visa Direct and MasterCard Send Network. We've kind of built it with 3D Secure. We have our own proprietary name matching that prevents fraudulent stolen cards. In the States with FedNow, I haven't seen anything that gives a clear definition around the liability of the pad and the length of it. So those are still things that are, I don't want to say the Wild West, but it's it's sort of like, hey, like look over here, you're going to be able to move money instantly, but there's still all the same rules that always applied, and there's no way to sort of make everyone sleep easier at night, which is really, it's the trick shot in all this, and that's what we hope to solve. Okay. And is your revenue model based on transaction fees or SaaS fees or both? Transaction fees, you know, you know. We make it the old-fashioned way in payments. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have some clients who have sectors of their business that they will sort of say, hey, you, know, you guys are doing a great job and we don't want you to sell to our competitors. And they'll, you know, we'll sign, they'll pay us a, a non-compete fee to, to, for the others, which is fine. I'm more than happy to do that if the money's okay. But we make most, if not all, of our money monthly transactions. But the beautiful thing about ZoomRails, and, I don't, and obviously I can wax lyrical about my baby all day long, but uh, we make more money than a typical payment company. Because not only do we have the four rails that we build for, and the states will have, you know, we'll have all the rails as well, plus the Venmos and all that. But because we have the open banking element to it, we have a little, like we built our own version of Plat, essentially. 
but it's very specific for payments and tied into that unique experience. So not only do we get the money from the bank connection, if someone has to reconnect the bank, but we also built insights. So insights is basically when, like a perfect example of this product is, hey, you're a lender. You want to offer online lending. Great. You go to the website, you click on, hey, apply for a loan. When you do the apply for the loan, connect your bank account, select TD Bank or RBC, BMO, whoever in Canada, bank is connected, that's a fee. Then we get the banking information and we digest it into 300 key points that all can all be returned via the API so that you could see, hey, is this the credit worthiness, the risk worthiness, five seconds. And then from there, at the same point, we've tokenized to see if the card is a Visa debit or MasterCard sent. So if you get approved, we can instantly send you the funds. Uh, if it's not, is it EFT or ACH? So we can get a pad in place. So we can at least set up recurring payments. And in Canada, we, it's Interact. And it's like American Venmo, but it'd be the same thing. All these rails get tokenized. So when if you get approved for the loan, you know, not only did we you know, Zoom rails charge for the initial connection and giving you the 300 key points that digest the account instantly, then there's the sending of the funds, which can happen instantly. And then there'll be the reoccurring payment uh, coming back. So a typical payment company, if you're an ISO, you're basically just making basis points off of credit cards, right? And maybe some terminal leasing or fixed fees off of gateways. But with us, it's, you know, we get to, we get to make more per client than the average, which is sort of one of the things I really like about our company in terms of a revenue potential. Okay. Okay. No, that explains it very well. And you mentioned lending as a vertical. What are the other verticals that you focus on? Yeah. So like the low-hanging fruit of Zoom Rails has really been the fintechs. We could boil it down and say we built like a fintech financial highway that allows fintechs who are focused on distribution of their product, whether it's like lending, insurance, mortgages, investments, crypto, to sort of onboard, underwrite, action sort of quickly and safely, especially in uh, markets such as like anywhere where you're transacting fiat into a digital asset, you would sort of want to make sure that one, like your AML is good, but also that you're not, you know, it's not a stolen card. It's, it's not bad actors. You want to sort of be able to sleep easy at night because it's, you know, that's not something that's easily claw back. You can claw back. So that's really been like part of the bread and butter, but also sort of those who are in pads, like reoccurring debits from bank accounts who are fantastic in that space as well as then we have like the software as a service so it could be anything really from lending software insurance software agricultural vending software karate studio software it all kind of ties the partner portal really ties all of the payments world together but sort of the off the shelf here zoom rails by itself really does have a niche market within the financial sector okay okay well what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there hmm Want the marketing answer or the real answer? <laughs> How about the real answer? If you worked at Zoom Rails, you heard me constantly say the word special. It shouldn't exist, this company. Like, every obstacle was thrown at it. Like, you know, initial version was contrived by me in, like, 2017 in a small room. And then Miles, who is my other co-founder and sort of, I guess he would say my brother in payments, he left his company to come work with me after I kind of showed him and you know we started at his his parents kitchen table and we went back and forth because he lived in Quebec and I lived in the Maritimes and then we slowly sort of pieced this together we almost had funding and then one day we just said we're going to go all in and we put all of our eggs on it so there was never an element of this could fail because it was really like we went all in on this like me and Miles put everything we had to essentially get the first version up and running so we're never afforded the luxury to do things sort of the way that everyone else got to do it. We had to think differently. And the idea is like, what's the narrow path for victory on something like this? How do we sort of say, hey, because it's cra- it's absolutely insane to be like, hey, look, me and this guy have a plan to beat open banking and instant payments to the market, and we're going to do it better. Like, that's an insane pitch to hear. And then also, then you hear me get into just like, hey, Stripe is weak. They have three key areas where if anyone can beat them, we could figure out a way to at least carve out a niche market where we don't have to compete against them. That's, you layer that on top of something that's nuts. But I have 15 years in payments. Miles, who is probably one of the most charismatic people I've ever met, and he's, he, Miles is the energy of the company. I'm the stoic guy who gets to sort of overthink things and figure out, hey, how can we do this? But together, we're able to build something special that did all that. And so, yeah, like uh, 
our competitors think about payments as just payments. We see it as something completely different. We think about distribution completely differently. We have one sales guy in a company of 42 people. That's unheard of for a payments company. A payments company is usually the inverse. Like We're all engineers. If I cut my engineering budget by 60%, I would still be able to operate, but I wouldn't be able to build new features. Like we're very much under the impression, and this is, you know, it's a product led approach. And like I said, we've gone all in on this, that these features are the differentiators that actually drive the sales process. The shaving basis points down, obviously there is, there's a place in the market for it, but I believe, especially on sort of the mid to higher grade accounts, it's how can you make my life easier? And our largest clients do the integration in one day. That's how good our product is. One day to do an integration that will move hundreds of millions of dollars a month. Like that's, and, and that's really, you know, that's what we strive for. So yeah, I think it's special. There's a huge piece of me in this company. There's a huge piece of miles in this company. And of course, like, I don't, I think I can maybe name one or two companies in North America who kind of sort of think about payments the same way we do, but uh, they're not on this podcast, so I'm not going to name them. So just, if you hear this part, just only <laughs> think ZoomRails does this. <laughs> love it. I love it. So where do you think the payments industry as a whole is going in the next couple of years? Well, instinct tells me it's going to move towards what ZoomRails is doing. I'm always cognizant of that we might be too early. I don't want to be Google Glass. I don't want to design something cool and just have be like, oh, well, no one really knows what to do with it in the market. So I believe that this is sort of where it's heading, is that payment companies are going to have to own more of their software. They're going to have to I think we're going to start seeing it now, especially in quasi-economic downturn, where there's going to be mergers between companies where the peripheral of sort of payments and validation kind of merge. And we're going to start to see sort of a thinning of the herd, perhaps, and making bigger companies, but with, hey, they're going to do name validation, or they're going to do ID validation, they're going to pair it with payments, or you're just going to start to see a lot of companies join or get bought out. And we've already started to see it, privately, Zoom Rails is gets inquiries all the time about it. So that's my educated guess. We're talking 10 years. Oof, not good. <laughs> I think digital currency is going to highly disrupt it. But I also believe that there's going to be a new way of thinking about payments. And maybe there'll be a new way of thinking about currency as a whole. And I think that will trickle down to payments. I think in 10 years, you're going to start to see companies who, not to say create their own currency, but they've figured out ways to compete against digital currency. Don't want to give up the ghost on that, but <laughs> there's, you know, there's a long-term plan. Sure. But I think that's really where, if I'm a payment company, I'm looking at that, I'm going, well, no, that's no good. That sort of completely disturbs our industry because I don't think, I don't believe the mechanics of that will be set for payments and it's going to create confusion at first. And then when obviously the government does something like this, it's going to be disruptive to anything because it, it's digital, so it should be able to move instantly. But what are the mechanics of it? How is it actually going to work? Is it just going to be, you know, are we just going to ignore Basel II for money supply? And yeah. who knows? But I think that's the one thing that would, if I was a payments company, I would try position myself somewhere away from having to deal with that. Yeah. I think that's some great insights there. Well, let's switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about you. So maybe tell us your career journey. So you brought us up to the point where you started to go, went to work for a bank and by 2017, 18, you started this company. So maybe fill in the gaps there of what you were doing professionally and then maybe talk a little bit about why you started this. Like you were sitting there at the table and why did this idea hit you? Well, you know, it was a shock to the system in 2008 when you're like, oh, I'm going to go I wanted to go work in Iceland and build hydrogen cars. And that was like all I wanted to do. And I think it was because, you know, I was the idea of building something with limited resources, like on an island, was always fascinating to me, I guess. It's like, hey, how, how do you succeed when you're not given all the tools in the world? And that probably plays in the part when, you know, like I ran shows and like music shows, I did 300 plus. And I'd say it's like DIY culture, but you're the sole source, like you have to solve all the problems. You book the shows, you have to figure out what draws, you have to deal with the venues, you have to deal with the bands, you have to deal with everything in between. So, you know, you're kind of given a crash course and not to sort of be a leader or a boss, but sort of just how to deal with problems, which is really all this job is. It's just, we say here in uh, Zoom Rails that uh, payments is just problem solving. That's probably why we have a 
bunch of puzzles as our logo. So I went to work for the bank. You know, you, you like, oh, what do you do the bank? Well, I was already working at the bank technically because I was working part time as like a FSR. I just got transitioned to the head office, and then I went to Treasury. Learned how the sausage was made, which is uh, how money moves. It's it's really ugly in Canada, and it's quite shocking. And then in around 2010, I was asked to come work for a company called VersaPay. And I think I was employee 10 or something, and they just went public. VersaPay at the time was a Chase ISO, which is just a fancy way of saying they resold Chase. But now that they've gone public, they needed ways to think about how they can differentiate themselves in the market. They had a, an idea of a product called Payport, which was basically Canada's first webhook enabled gateway, which is another fancy way of saying, instead of writing to 125 pages of banking STFP files, you could just have a nice little API that allows you to move money between bank accounts. So basically, I took that product and ran with it. I did, sold it, managed it, did operations with it. And it was about, you know, I think from 2010 to 2017, 1,500 different rollouts and integrations from every type of client, government, companies that were like ZoomRails but became unicorns, and to lots of companies in between. And sort of when you do that and you do these rollouts, and not just selling, I mean understanding what their problem is, you can then start to shape what you think the future of the market is. Because the number one question is, isn't like, oh, what do you need to do? It's like, tell me your problem. And then when you hear about what they're trying to do and hear about their accomplishment, you can put the pieces of the puzzle together in your head and start to shape the product. So I did that. 2017 comes around. VersaPay sells a part of its business to BluePay to keep funding the ARC, which was their invoicing platform. I wasn't part of that team, so I basically got bought out. Uh, at that time, I was actually already living in Prince Edward Island, going back and forth, where I have a farm. <laughs> so I was doing farming and payments. So yeah, and then I was just like, okay, well, what do I do? Because that's a shock. Listen, one of the most, I don't want to say traumatic, but when VersaPay sold that part of the business, me and my, my partner in it, because we were two people who made the majority of the revenue at that time, too, for the company. You know, the whole company gathers around your desk. And basically, this, you know, the CEO at the time tells you, hey, these two guys are being the sacrificial lambs because we need, we need the revenue. We need the money, not the revenue, to keep the other part afloat. <laughs> so, so it was like, it's a shock to the system. I'll never forget just look, having my head down the whole time going, how did this happen? Because yeah, I was, I, I'm not going to lie, I loved what I did. I was so happy, you know, not only because I was making money, but there was a sense of like, hey, you're helping, you're building. It was something new. You had a, a piece of the market that really couldn't be touched. So I always wanted that product to be better. I don't want to say there was like unfinished business, but it got built and it never took the final steps. So yeah. 2017, everyone's talking about instant payments, everyone's talking about open banking. And then maybe it's culture I grew up in where you just do it, you know, it's the problems on you to solve it. And that's what I did. And not only did I do that, I actually had an ISO business that I used that I started like the, the next day to fund the Zoom Rails, because I knew that I had a family. I can't just, hey, we're gonna mortgage, we're gonna remortgage our house and I had to create a revenue stream and then do Zoom Rails at the same time. So it was tough, but like, that's the thing. It was like, I wanted to be purposeful. Like I wouldn't want to do something that wasn't special. And yeah, personally, it feels good to say that I could do something that everyone's talked about, but we did. It's like, no, 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 no. Like you can, you can talk uh, at all the payment summits, all the payment conferences about all this stuff, but we did it and we did it better. So that's really how we get to, uh, to Zoom Rails. And then there's there's a whole bunch of stuff in between, like living in basements, <laughs> sleeping at my uh my sleeping at my uh my business partner Miles is in his childhood bedroom two weeks out of a month well in Montreal, people pulling out of deals last minute, the pandemic when we we launched the website a week before the pandemic, then we didn't see anyone for 18 months because we all worked remote and so yeah. <laughs> it's it's a crazy story. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. And definitely, if we had more time, we could dive into some of those because they're always quite interesting. Well, what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe a, a work-related passion and a personal passion. Oh, I guess it's just solving problems. <laughs> it's like a work-related passion. You know, one of the things is like, hey, like I didn't expect to sort of, you know, Zoom kind of just came and happened. And one day you're 
three people. And then the next day you're 40 some odd people and you're having an employee in the United States and you're making deals with Pfizer. If it's, you know, day by day, you're just solving problems or not just not to downplay any of it, but always enjoy that. Just there's satisfaction into the building and to the problem solving. Personally, like, you know, obviously I mentioned that I enjoy farming. And when I say that, you know, we had hobby farms and the early days of Zoom Rails when people would hear my office was right next to the duck pen. The, like the wall was literally on the other side of the wall, there was a five foot gap path. And then there was a pen full of ducks. So you'd casually always hear ducks. Or one day my business partner, Miles called me and he was just like, Mark, well, Mark, what's wrong? And I was gasping for breath. I was like, oh, the sheep got out and I had to run and chase them everywhere. So yeah, again, that probably falls back into building something because you, know, you, you take some raw earth on one day you plant 300 different berry plants and you plant an orchard and then you build a, a goose, <laughs> you know, a goose house out of scrap wood that you find and somehow it survives three winters. You know, that's, that's all the fun stuff that I enjoyed. And I think it, you can put me anywhere as long as I have something to build and feel satisfied about. I, I think I'll do fine. Right. Right. Well, um, you've been in payments 15 years and obviously you have a passion for starting and building things. But what would you say to someone who's just coming into our industry, say they've just graduated from college and, you know, they look at payments or fintech and want to build a career in this industry. What would you tell them that they should do when they get started to be successful? Do everything you can to be the smartest person in the room. The era of selling payments by traditional sales means is almost over. You want to be able to solve you don't want to hum and haw. You want to have your answers ready. Know your product inside and out. Someone asks a question about it. It doesn't matter if you're in operations or marketing. You've got to know everything about that product and every and all the key things that would sort of make someone on the other end tick or feel welcome about it. Payments isn't just... When it becomes a commodity, it, it, it's not to say it's not interesting, but it does a disservice to what payments is. Payments is a risk-based business. It's a risk Essentially, because obviously credit cards, there's you know we're, there's money being fronted. That's why there's basis points. EFT, it's no different, or a, any of the other means. But think of it from the client's end. They have to trust you with their money, so you should have the, always your answers and understand your product inside and out. Because nothing would make someone feel more uncomfortable knowing that the lifeblood of their business is being handled by someone who doesn't understand that. Yes, we all know that there's money in payments. That's a given. That's why. You know, a lot of people who are successful in payments, they stay in payments for a long time. But if you want to be one of those people, especially for the future, you have to have your answers and try and be as smart as humanly possible about the product that you are working with. And also the industry, because like I said, it comes down to trust and it comes down to risk. Yeah, I think that's definitely some some very, very good advice right there. I think your your career has proven those things. The other thing that resonated with me is how you're talking about the financial interactions, right? So taking the payments part, which to me can sound very transactional and making it into more of a financial interaction. So I thought that was quite interesting. Well, Mark, we've covered a lot of ground about you and the company, your background, where you see things going in the future. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? If you're listening to this, check out ZoomRails, Z-U-M-R-A-I-L-S.com. Big things are coming. That's really it. <laughs> I'm not the hype man of the company. <laughs> uh, Miles is the better at that. But I will say this is like, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of good people who work for me. The one thing that I quickly realized is that I can be the jack of all trades in the company, but I need to hire people who are the masters of their zone. And I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good people surround me to fill in the gaps that I don't possess. So any of my employees who are listening to this, we all heard the word special. I, you know, I tell you you're special if you work at ZoomRails. And I truly do have some of the greatest people who have sacrificed their time and efforts to help build this company. That's awesome. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Fantastic. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.